With the new year, health, wellness, weight loss, and exercise programs will be in mass promotion. Just because someone looks good doesn't mean that what they're pitching is healthy or will even work. Watch out for unrealistic claims of results. Today's guest is Natalia Petrozella. Natalia is a historian of contemporary American politics and culture. She is an author and podcast host. She is a frequent media guest expert, public speaker, contributor to international and domestic news outlets, including New York Times, The Washington Post, and CNN. She is an associate professor of history and holds a BA from Columbia, as well as a master's and PhD from Stanford. I'm your host, Chris Parker, and this is the Easy Pray Podcast. Natalia, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Pray Podcast today. I'm glad to be here. So can you give myself and the audience a little background on who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is Natalia Petrosella, and I'm a historian of modern American culture and politics. And most recently, I have spent a long time researching American fitness culture, how we became a country so obsessed with working out and wellness, even though that working out and wellness isn't really accessible to a lot of Americans. So that's kind of what uh, gets me excited about work every day. That's awesome. It was funny. I was just recently recording an episode on travel. And we were talking about what makes uh, Westerners a target or obvious that you're American. And one of those things is, well, if you're overweight, you're probably American. Yes, but then also I thought you were going to see something else. I was living in France a couple of years ago, and this mom comes up to me at drop-off, and she's like, oh, are you American? I said, yeah. And I said, how did you know? And she's like, because you're wearing athletic clothing, like not to do exercise. So it kind of cuts both ways, you know? <laughs> I, I've heard that one also. Americans either don't exercise or they kind of announce that they exercise. Right. Sometimes both at the same time, which is an interesting <laughs> paradox. <laughs> that it is. So let's talk about kind of the, the health and fitness culture of the U.S. because uh, I've grown up in Southern California and I'm not the most fit person. I'm not, hopefully I'm not horrifically unfit either, but I've definitely seen, you know, Southern California so focused on, on health and wellness and the latest fads. I, let's talk about some of the Let's talk. Let's talk about some just general health first, and then we'll go into fitness. So, what are some of like the? Let's talk about some of the historic health fads, and then some of the current health fads. Yeah. So, one of the things that's super interesting as a historian is that you know I think as long as people have been alive, they've been interested in some ways in health, right? In survival. But what that health looks like has changed a lot over time. And if you look at even the past like 100 years in American history, health and exercise things that we unite today, like very closely, almost synonymously, were not actually linked at all. And that even if you go back as recently as the early 1950s, but even beyond that, like people who worked out regularly, you're in Southern California, like those muscle beach characters, they were considered suspicious because they worked out. Like the idea was if you wanted to build, if you were building big muscles like that, you were literally muscle bound, like you would be imprisoned by your muscles. And that anybody who spent that much time working on their bodies probably had something wrong with them because they weren't spending time on more sort of cerebral pursuits. And it could even be physically bad for you. Like during the jogging craze in the 60s and 70s, there were all these doctors who were like, it will kill you. Like you're overtaxing your heart. And for women, you will not be able to have babies, your uterus is going to fall out. So there has like, one of the things I'm so interested in is today it's like, oh, you want to be healthy, go exercise. And like, whether you do it or not, people nod their head like, yeah, that makes sense. That is a relatively recent construction. Yeah. I, I, I don't remember like jogging will kill you, but that's just kind of funny that it's so much for culture. We do that kind of flip flop of, um, you know, jogging is bad for you. Jogging is is the only thing you should be doing. And now right. I think we're probably realizing, you know, it's going to, if, if you're my age, it's going to hurt your knees. There's probably better things to do. Well, I think you're so right. And you started by talking about like fads and you just said like, you know, jogging is the only thing you should do. And I think so much of like what's problematic in American fitness culture is that like all or nothing mentality and like that sales pitch of like, if you want to be hot and healthy and live forever, you must do this thing and only this thing. And honestly, nothing satisfies that, right? So you end up in this pendulum swing of, oh, now everyone should do yoga. Oh, wait, yoga is really bad for you. Like, right. And it's probably moderation in most things is the right, uh, right thing to, to, to embrace, but that doesn't tends not to sell so well. 
Is that kind of the issue is that we're, as Americans particularly, we're so kind of instant gratification focused. It's we're trying to, I want to be, I want to have a healthy lifestyle, but I only want to do it in two minutes a day. Well, yeah, I think, you know, before I I criticize the attitudes of individual Americans, I think like the bigger picture issue is that most of like health and fitness is available to us in like a consumer marketplace, right? So, you know, there's like an incentive to differentiate your product and say it's like the miracle cure and it's so amazing. And so there's this kind of like escalating competition of who can like promise better returns. And so that's like a big picture context. And then, yes, of course, people respond accordingly because all those companies have like really great like consumer behavior research. And yes, there's a desire of like, oh, well, I want to buy the thing that gets me abs in two minutes a day or no, I heard the seven minute one is, is, is good. And um, so I think that like those things feed on each other, like a culture where health is a commodity and a product and where people are like basically talked to as consumers rather than in, 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 as, you know, like human beings or citizens. Kind of the consumer versus partner. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Or consumer versus citizen or consumer versus like, I don't know, member of like a community. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the uh, the, the current fads in, in health and fitness? Um, well, there are a lot of things. I mean, people talk about in terms, I'm really like more expert in fitness. And I should say, in, in addition to being like a gym rat and a, a person with a PhD who studies this stuff as a cultural and historical phenomenon, I also have a, a fitness certification and I've taught fitness for many years. So I'm not just like speaking as an outsider here. Um, but to start with the realm that I'm less expert in, you know, in like in, in the food, in the food domain people talk a lot about right now about like intermittent fasting and like what you should be doing it's like only eating a certain number of hours a day and then not eating at all the other parts of the day that i think and i'm not even valuing i'm not even evaluating the merits of this because i know people who are very happy with what that's done for them I know that there's research that goes kind of both ways on, on whether that actually is healthy in a long term. But in my not that long lifetime, I remember when like the article of faith was like, you need to eat all day. Like I had this book and it was a best selling book and it was like fist size, like protein, like every two hours. And like, that's your ticket to health and beauty. And now we go totally in the opposite direction. Eat as much as you want in this like eight hour window. And then you eat absolutely nothing. And I think I do believe that science changes and there are real evolutions in in what people believe but if you like it's hard to kind of take anyone seriously when the pendulum swings so far and that's just like one example i think in the food realm and i don't know if this this fits in with with your your historian focus why why does this do you know why the science seems to change so much is it cherry picking is it just not real science or is there a bunch of paths to to the end. That's a great that no that it is in my realm to the extent that like I'm interested in the history of knowledge and how it gets made and I think one thing that's really interesting is that you know for a long time and I mean up until maybe like the late 1960s or so, there wasn't actually a huge body of research on what exercise would do for you. People were kind of shooting from the hip. Like there's this famous book called Jogging that comes out in 1966 and it's credited with like kicking off the beginning of the jogging phase in the US. What is remarkable about it when you read it is there's like no data in there. It's like, oh, this team does road work and that works well for them and you should try this too. There's a big change that happens a couple of years later when this military physician, and it's no accident that it's the military that starts to think really seriously about like bo- the body and science. This military physician, Kenneth Cooper, basically releases this book. It's called Aerobics, not like Jane Fonda Aerobics, but like cardio, basically. And he has done all these trials on like what it does for your body to run, bike, swim, as opposed to lift weights or do calisthenics, which is basically how people thought of exercise before then. So that is like mind blowing and paradigm shifting in terms of how people thought about exercise, because all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's not going to strain your heart. That's good for you. And the people who should be doing it are not just like big muscle dudes on muscle beach. This is for like a homemaker or a child and all of that. And so that science evolved. And then later, I'm just like picking some high points there, uh, high points here. Later, you start to see, especially in like the 1990s, the resurgence of strength training, having shed 
a lot of the negative like baggage of, oh, it'll make you muscle bound. It'll make you unattractive. And you start seeing um, a kind of scientific literature talking about how it's good for bone health. Mm-hmm. You see kind of like in the magazines, a more muscular ideal come out. So why does science change? Well, I'm like, you know, I'm like optimistic enough to think that people are genuinely trying to figure out what's better for you. Um, but um, there is definitely, I think in the fitness and health world, a lot of like BS science out there. There's a lot of cherry picking. There are a lot of people where if you scratch the surface and you look at what their degree is, it's actually not in the thing that they're weighing in on. Um, And a lot of people paid by companies to make specific claims. And because, you know, it's still not really a super regulated space, the whole fitness world. And I think that's important. The last thing I'll just say on that, like, you know, you ask about changes in science, but Unfortunately, I think a lot of people are getting their health and fitness advice, not because somebody is the leading scientist in that realm, but actually because they have like really great abs and they have a lot of followers on Instagram. And I think we can't think about health in this country without thinking about how much we often very wrongly connect health to what we think the appearance of health is and give people authority to give advice accordingly. So I would be, I'm not saying if you have a perfect six pack, you're not qualified to give fitness advice, but I don't think that qualifies you in itself at all. And I think that's something that is worth being said. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think that is one of the challenges kind of in the health and fitness space is we equate appearance with health. That that's if, right. so, if someone looks muscular and they look fit, then that for some reason that must equate to they're going to live a long life. They're not going to have health issues. Their, their knees aren't going to give out on, on them where – appearance and what what's going on inside are are not always the same thing. Uh, absolutely. They're often not the same thing. And I think, you know, just like science has changed, like body ideals have changed too. And so hopefully we've evolved a little bit in like decoupling like a particular physical appearance with like, oh, that person must be healthy. But we have a long, long way to go on that front. Like there are lots of people who you would look at and let's just say they wouldn't be on the cover of like muscle and fitness or any magazine for their, for their health, but they actually are leading quite a healthful life and their health might be better than somebody who, you know, it, what's something that's in the news a lot is these um, uh, performance enhancing drugs that especially men are taking to like achieve that look of like muscularity, that look that makes them look like the picture of health, but actually people die from taking those. Right. And I think that's worth mentioning too, on like a general interest podcast, because I'm not talking talking about bodybuilders like it, who are like heavy steroid users. I'm talking about like guys who are like, I want to look sexy at the beach this summer. And so I'm going to take this. And there's a lot more casual um, use of that these days. And yeah, the appearance of health it gives you is sometimes quite at odds with the actual health that it, health issues it can cause. Yeah. I know when, when I was in college, the popular thing for weight loss, I suppose, was uh, the ECA stack, the ephedra caffeine, uh, uh, aspirin, you take all these at the same time, then go work out. Then something magical happens chemistry wise and you lose weight and later on. It's like, Ooh, ephedra, it's going to cause significant totally. issues. <laughs> Oh my God. I'm not proud to say when I was in high school, I was like taking, I remember the box was called diet fuel and it was like ephedra and um, yeah, I would take it and go work out. And I don't know if it's because I was 17. And so I was just like really thin anyway, or if it was that, but that was like not a good road to go down and certainly was not health promoting. So uh, like, what are the things that we should be watching out for then? So we've kind of said like there's, there's, yeah. You know, this this really is, and like you think, you know, we, humans been around so long. You, you think we'd actually have done so more, done more science on ourselves, and less, maybe less on the stars or something. But yeah, it, it seems like it's very much an emergent. Like the the real legitimate science is still really emerging on what's good, what's what is healthy, what is good for longevity. What are the things that we should be watching out for that we know that are uh, definitely going to be causing problems? Yeah, no, it's such a great question. Well, I think the first thing that you should look out for, and this is easy to look out for because it's like part of our own worldview, is how much you are connecting appearance with health. How much are you believing what someone is saying or selling because they look the way you want to look or they look the way you think is healthy? Because that is a real red flag. I mean, as someone who's worked in gyms her whole life, um, let me tell you, I understand why you kind of want the fitness instructor to look the way you want to look. I understand that. But don't assume that because they look that way, that they are healthy. So I think 
think that's an assumption that one should really evaluate in oneself. Another thing that I think is really important to look at is like any product that's being sold to you, ask yourself like, who benefits from this? Who benefits from this? Right? Like who's selling, like who's selling this? Like, what do they have to gain from it? Like, what's the agenda here? And also like, what are the claims that they're making? Anybody who is making absolute claims about weight loss or about the unique power of one product to change your body or your health is probably completely full of it because we know, like we know exercise is good for you, but we know it doesn't do anything unless it is combined with healthful eating and other kind of lifestyle changes. So I think watching out for those really extreme promises is really, really important as well. And then, you know, we talked a little bit about scientific research. I, I do believe that you should evaluate the credentials of the people who are giving you um, advice. But I also think, to be honest, most of us don't have the time or the expertise to go back and read those original scientific studies. Yeah. Like I do, I have a PhD. <laughs> In history, I cannot go and read most like, you know, peer reviewed exercise physiology articles, nor do I have that much time or interest to do it. But I do think like, um, and I think I say that because I think like, especially in this moment, like the whole idea of like, I did my research has been used in some really like bad ways and like, we should be careful about that. But I think that, um, you know, thinking about who's giving the advice, not just what they look like, but where their authority and their credentials come from and the kind of claims that they're making, those are like a couple of really great ways to um, assess how you're spending your money and your time and what you're doing to your body, which is so important. I'm actually shocked often, and I'm not outside of this myself, like this is our body and this is our life. And this is like the in most intimate and important part of us. And we're like, so willing, I am not sure why, because we want to look hot or like be perceived as, you know, caring about our health. Well, like do so much crazy experimentation on it. Oh, I'm not going to eat 16 hours a day. That seems like a great idea. Oh, let me get these supplements full of ephedra at GNC and like pop them. Like, let me try that. Like, it's pretty crazy how little care we often practice on this thing that we need to live on this earth. So it's funny because I know people who will spend, you know, ridiculous amounts of time. They're, they're going to buy a new car and they, you know, pick up all the leading the magazines and read all the articles and they're, you know, comparing engine torque and you know, they'll, they'll spend weeks or months making a decision on what kind of car they want to buy. But then it's like, oh, hey, I saw this new weight loss drug. I'm going to try it. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think, you know, it's so interesting. I talked to so many different audiences about this kind of stuff. And like, you really have to kind of know who you're speaking to and like calibrate your message accordingly. Because on the one hand, I think you're so right, right? Like so many people do all this kind of like research and are so careful about like buying a car or a computer or things like that, or like the school they're sending their children to whatever. And then are like, popping random weight loss drugs. On the other hand, we live in a culture where it can be so easy to get so obsessed with like everything health related. You know, it's, it's an affliction. It's called orthorexia, where you are like, you know, counting your macros and how many calories and how many, what are my calibrations of sh sugar and protein and all the rest? How am I working out? Like that's another form of obsession and a pathology. And yeah, it's just, it's hard to know. And so I guess like it, this gets back to, I guess the old, Socratic claim to know thyself is like really being really important. But I think that like a little bit of introspection as you embark on any of these projects and spend your money on them and your time is really important. It's almost like a little bit more realistic to like, what are your goals and why are these your goals? Are you trying to be healthy or are you trying to look a particular way and being honest about what your goals are? Yeah. And I know that's really important. And, you know, as a woman, I've thought about this like really personally too, and how much like baggage that we often attach to like, oh, I was so bad today. I feel so guilty because I didn't exercise or because I ate something. And something that I have found I have found to be so liberating is kind of like really reflecting on like that moral language around like food mm. and exercise. I mean, like it doesn't have to be that way. Okay. I ate a bunch of chocolate cake and now I like don't look exactly the, the way I want to look. And so now I have to make some changes. It doesn't make me like a freaking failure or a bad person. Like you just kind of move forward. And I think we all are different in that way. And so, you know, I'm, I'm 43 years old. So it's like taken me a while to like get to figure this stuff out. But, you know, I hear again, people with good 
intentions, peddling their way as like the way, like, for example, some people talk about intuitive eating as having like shit save their life. And like one precept of intuitive eating is like not calorie counting and not recording food and sort of like listening to your body and figuring out what it needs and eating accordingly. And those people like hate all of the food counter apps and all of those things. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. I think that's right for like certain people who have become, you know, are like too preoccupied with that and have the constant voice in their head. I know other people for whom that is like a pathway to binge eating and to like totally sort of like losing control of, um, you know, what they put in their body, not in a way that you should be so super controlled, but it's just not the right solution for them. And so with everything, even the things that claim to be like really body positive and accepting, I'm like, there is no one answer here, people. You got to figure out who you are and your relationship to this stuff and navigate this really confusing marketplace, which is not really all that interested in your health, they're interested in selling you things. And I, I guess that's that's also kind of one of the dynamic things about it. It's not, it's everybody's health situation is a little bit different, how active they are, what they do. I sit down at a desk for most of the day. Other people, if you're, you know, a FedEx driver, you're running, you know, especially this time of year, you're running, you know, you're, you're running yourself ragged, literally running, carrying boxes all day long. And yeah. my personal, uh, psychological mentality, you know, my, the, what goes on in my head concerning food is going to be different than what goes on in somebody else's head. And then if you throw in, you know, health conditions on top of that, it really makes it a very dynamic environment. Oh, absolutely. And I think something else that I think is important to think about, not like so much in terms of your personal health, but just thinking of like this whole marketplace in this context is like, you know, a FedEx driver, an Amazon driver, a warehouse worker, like not only is the nature of their work doing different from somebody who's sitting at the desk, but also probably their range of options to exercise and to be healthy are also probably very yeah. different because they don't make a lot of money. They don't have a lot of control over like the hours that they're working. They're doing physical labor, but that's not really exercise. It's like repetitive injury kind of labor. And so, you know, that's something I've been really interested in thinking about too. Also, like, just think about things like, you know, well, think about this, that like, you know, often like around running, there's like this, like, like myth, this really lovely thought that like, all you need is motivation and a pair of sneakers to go outside. And to an extent that's true. You don't need a gym membership, et cetera. But let me tell you, depending on the neighborhood you live in and like what body you live in, your ability to go hit the road and go for a jog is very, very different. And yeah. so I think like some of that, like super like individualistic, like inspo, I think is something to also be skeptical of. Cause it sounds, it's great to think all you need is to rally yourself and go outside, but not everybody has the same access to that. And so I think like, I am not going to feel bad about myself about missing a workout. If it meant that I would have to go running after dark, like here through New York city, because sorry, as a woman, that is like a lot worse to go do that than it is to miss a day working out. And, yeah. you know, different people have different challenges in that regard. Yep. So let's talk about two, the, let's go back to, you talked about extreme promises from products. Let's talk about that. And then let's talk about gym memberships because that is yeah. something that I always find very interesting. Totally. Um, so just like, um, what do you want me to say about extreme products? Well, <laughs> like like just... what, what would like, to, to me, in my mind, I always think of, um, you know, the, the commercial of, oh, I, you know, I use this product and I lost 200 pounds. I'm like, over what time, you know, like how quickly did right. you lose that 200 pounds? Cause that right. could be really scary, but like, what are, what, what should be the red flags of like, gee, that's, that's not realistic. That's not going to yeah. like, they might have a person saying I did this and this was my result, but where should we be going? That's probably not the, the average, what the, the average consumer's response to this product right. is going to be. Okay, so I think that any kind of extreme results we should look at with a degree of great skepticism. So the most often, the most frequent example of this is definitely around weight loss, where you see people who have like these incredible transformations. They've lost. 40 or 60 or 100 pounds, and you see the before and after pictures, and you're like, oh my God. I actually think, I think the extremeness of that is, um, you know, something to be doubted. I also think not just about weight loss, but when you hear people sort of like speaking about like, this changed my whole life. Once I got on this meal plan, I found a husband and a new job and all this. And I do believe that like when I ran a marathon, I felt so successful and proud that I felt like other things in my life did follow 
fall into place too. But I would be very skeptical about anyone who is selling you that kind of dramatic transformation, either of your body or your life. Now this, I often get um, like yelled at when I say, but I think it's true. I would also be very skeptical of products that are specifically selling you weight loss. And this isn't because I don't think that using them in the way that's directed will cause you to lose weight. Often it does, but the whole weight loss industry is predicated on the fact that you will gain it back. <laughs> like very, very few people are able to keep off big amounts of weight mm -hmm. um, for any sustained period of time, or if they're able to do it, they are able to do it with such a dramatic modification to their life that maybe it's worth it for them. I don't want to like begrudge anyone that, yeah. but that um, it's probably a lot harder than they're selling that, than they're selling it to you in, in the, um, in the ad. And so with health and fitness things, I mean, I, it's okay to want to lose weight. And like, you know, I think it's like a lot of people probably should lose weight to be a little bit healthier, but I think that um, I'm very skeptical of products that center weight loss mm -hmm. as the outcome, because one, we hear that freaking messaging all the time. And I just like, I'm sick of that. And we should privilege other forms of healthy, uh, of like being healthy. But I also think it's, we know that people can't keep it off for a long time. And so it's unfair to keep selling that ideal and making people feel like failures when they can't keep it off. And to me, that's like a very, very important part of it. So that, those extreme those kinds of extreme promises and specifically those around weight loss to me are total red, red flags. Yeah, it's the take this product and you'll lose weight. You don't even have to work out. Right. Oh, for, and something for nothing. Forget about it. I mean, one of the things that's been so interesting as a historian is that these in the days when women were really not encouraged to exercise, but of course, we're still supposed to look pretty. You saw that there were all of these like um, they called them slenderizing salons. And mm -hmm. the way that they advertised themselves was relax in luxurious comfort, no sweating necessary. And they basically it was like a proto gym. But the whole idea was like passive exercise. And we even see things like that, you know, a little bit today with some of like, there's still some of those vibrating belts and stuff that advertise it. It's not really work and it'll change your body. Newsflash, you usually have to work to create change in any aspect of your life. <laughs> and, and that's the tough thing. I know I, a while back, I started working with a, a personal trainer and one of my key things to him was this has to, I want to do things that I can do the rest of my life. Like, yeah, my, like, not that I don't want to work with you, but like this needs to be sustainable, reproducible, that I don't have to have some $5,000 piece, $5, piece of gym equipment to do. It's got to be stuff that I can do if I'm traveling. Like I, I need to be able to sustain this, not like have this, you know. Of, of, uh, I'm not trying to lose, uh, lose weight for a wedding or look good for a wedding. Yeah. So. I think that's such a good point. And like, so in some ways, I think it's really great that exercise culture has become so like um, so much a part of our life and that like more people who are not interested in being in a bodybuilding show or like, you know, that, that more people are exercising regularly. However, there's a side of it, which is like, oh my God, this is like now this pressure that everybody feels to sort of like work out all the time. Like there's this really great book by Barbara Ehrenreich about growing old. And she's like, you know, when I retired, people were like, congrats, you have a new job you now go to the gym every single day. And she's like, is this what I have? This is what I have to do to stave off death. Like, is it really worth that? And so there's like a mixed bag there, but I think like you bring up a really good point that like, uh, uh, I think a, a positive thing to do is as you avoid those quick fixes or those extreme promises is to think about one, what's sustainable in your life, whether it's financially or in terms of your routine. And also like, what do you like to do? Um, well, I do believe you need to sometimes work and really get uncomfortable to like, you know, maintain your health, there's a good chance that if you hate doing the thing that you're doing, you're just not going to do it. You know, like I definitely, I try and do some workouts that I'm not crazy about like one or two times a week. I don't like love doing some like strength and flexibility work. I do it. But let me tell you, I'm going to a dance class tonight because I know that unless it was a class that I was really excited for, am I really going to go after work? It's snowing and 30 degrees outside. <laughs> no, but I cannot wait to hit that dance floor, even if like, that's not the thing that's the best for my bone density and whatever. So so I think it's like figuring that out, um, it, it, figuring out what you want and what you should be drawn to, mm -hmm. as opposed to just like warding off like the scams, because th there are a lot of scams out there. Yeah. But it's sort of more fun to look for the positive stuff. <laughs> so one of the things I want to talk about was that like the 
this ep- while we're recording this in November, this episode is going to go live in, in January or should be live in January. And that's the, that's the time frame of uh, every gym out there offering all sorts of programs. And uh, I've heard so many horror stories about gym memberships. What's kind of your, your view on gym memberships? Well, you know, it depends what the horror stories are, you know, for years, um, gyms often ha- found it, for years, gyms often had a really hard time getting um, real estate and leases in like sort of nicer areas because what they were known to do is say they were coming, sell a lot of like pre-sale memberships and then never open and like leave people in a lurch. So that kind of speaks to that wild west of like the fitness industry. That's no longer really the case. Actually, now one of the indicators of an affluent neighborhood is the fitness businesses there because they're so tied with luxury. Um, And so, yeah, January is coming. I can tell you as someone who has worked in gyms, there's like always those employee email chains or like people get ready, like the big rush is coming. Be nice to the newbies who are going to be like dropping weights and like not knowing what's going on. And um, I mean, I always sort of like that time of year, even though the gyms are super crowded. And for people who are there all year, there's a little bit of like, all right, like you're only going to last till February. But I think it's exciting to see people kind of like, um, you know, passionate about a new start and about trying, getting a new healthy part of their routine. And in terms of what to be aware of, I mean, I would think hard about what you really can integrate into your life. So that like trendy new whatever studio that everybody's talking about might be offering a great deal. But if it's across town, are you really going to go there all the time? You know, there might be, um, I know, you know, in Southern California and where I am in New York City, like the studio fitness industry has really struggled throughout the pandemic. So I saw a studio recently. So by the way, I'm not saying not don't support gyms, like gyms need your business right now, but support them in the way that you'll keep showing up there and not cancel after your first billing cycle. But I think, um, you know, I saw some studios who were offering like very deep discounts for off peak times, mm-hmm. like going at like 5.30 in the morning or or um, like two in the afternoon. And those deals can be super attractive. But again, does that fit into your life? Are you really going to get up at like 4.45 in the morning to go to the gym? Because it's like $10 less for that class. Maybe in California where it's warm all the time. Here, that's a much tougher proposition. So I think um, there are going to be a ton of deals, especially now that like there's a lot more vaccination. And I think people are more comfortable going into uh, brick and mortar fitness. We know that people actually are getting going back into gyms, but I would be wary of signing on to deals that no matter how like excited you are about new year, new you, um, that might not be sustainable um, to really be worth it. And I also look at like some of these places that are uh, product specific that we, we just do this type of. Uh, let's say it's uh, let's say it's a rowing. You know, we we just do rowing. We have a bunch of rowing machines or a bunch of cycles only. That if you haven't done that, you probably don't want to buy the the two year membership. And then, yeah. re- and then realize a month into it, I I don't like row. I don't like cycling. This is horrible. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's so true. So there's been like this real specialization in the industry in the last few years. I mean, pre-pandemic, that was the big trend, right? These like unique studios that are not only like luxury anymore, but have like in some ways much more affordable price points. And those businesses tend to, as you say, offer like one thing, right? It's a spin studio or a bar studio, et cetera. I mean, some people find their thing and they're totally obsessed with it. I tend, and to a certain extent, Hey, if you love it, moving every day is probably better than not moving every day. So do your spin class every day. I think probably for optimal health, you want to mix up what you're doing. Um, There are, you know, products that are like aggregators that have you be able to sort of have these like collective memberships like ClassPass um, was just acquired by MindBody. But ClassPass like allows you to like try out a bunch of places before you really fully commit. We still have the big box gyms, which offer a whole bunch of things. I guess another tip that I have also is like, Think about like what will motivate you to get in the door. I actually quit my big box gym because I found that I was so busy that I'd either not go. I'd be like, oh, I'll go later. I could go. It's open all the time. And then it's like 10 o'clock at night. Or I'd be like going for 25 or 30 minutes when like that, I really know I should work out longer than that. But now, you know, it's a little bit more expensive. But when I'm on the hook for a prepaid class, like I'm going, I'm like too cheap to throw like 40, 50 bucks down the, down the drain, just because I like scrolling Instagram or answering emails. So, um, you know, you got to know yourself. You really do. And not, we're talking about commercial fitness, but like, please, especially like where you are, like, 
the great outdoors, like, come on. Like I, I actually hate running in the cold, like more than anything, but I have this friend. And the only time that we hang out is to do these 6am runs for an hour. And we're like, you're doing like six and a half, seven miles. Cause we're just like chatting the whole time. And that's another, I think, great way to motivate yourself. Yeah, finding well, also finding a buddy to to work out with yeah, a little bit of that totally. accountability because heaven knows you know when it's when we just had that slice of cake we're like I don't, I don't want to go I feel bad I want to I just want to hide right and do you notice that like that uh, to me like that actually one of my most powerful fitness and health promoting experiences is meeting this friend for mutual accountability and like going on these runs guess what no one's selling me anything there so like the things that i was say- saying before to watch out for like who's making money off this no one's making money off that honestly like are they making extreme promises our rule is if you can't talk, you're moving too fast. So we are not like going extreme here. This is not race training. And like some that is so much better than not going, but it's not a sell and it's not like an extreme exercise thing. It's just like integrating exercise to your life, whether that's socializing or or otherwise. That's a great way to look at look at it is it's not it's not Gosh, as Americans, I think we do a great job of siloing our lives. Yeah. This is my work life. This is my personal life. This is my family life. This is my exercise. And well, I don't exercise with people I work with or that I, you know, I, you know, that we're very siloed in that way and, and yeah. kind of avoid some of the ways that might be helpful for us. I think so. And I, you know, I wonder if the pandemic is going to change that a little bit. Like my husband has a very like buttoned up job on Wall Street. And like in the pandemic, since as they've been sort of released from the office and some of the sort of like literal suit and tie culture of that, like he now meets people for walking meetings. Right. And like, you know, like two years ago, that would be seen as like almost like a weird, like hippie thing. Like, what do you want to like walk around the park while we're talking about some company? But like that, I think is like what you're talking about. Like in many ways, our silos, particularly between work and like home have been totally banished yeah. or at least reorganized in the past uh, year and a half. And there's a lot of negative to that, but I think that there's also some positive. And as we like rebuild um, things that we can be more conscientious about the life that we want. And and, you know, around exercise, I think it's super interesting. Like everyone was like, gyms will never come back now that everybody has Pelotons and like home kettlebells and all that. They never will. And I do think some people like home fitness obviously has boomed and people are like, oh, my God, I can do this stuff at home. And the connected uh, technologies are really good, too. But look at the stock price of Planet Fitness. It is going up. Like people want to get something other than that calorie burn out of exercise. And so to your point about siloing, like seeing other people, being not 10 feet from where you did your Zoom call like 10 minutes ago, like all of that means something. And I think we're in this really exciting moment where we can think about what we want and what health means as more than like the size of your waist or the number of calories that you consume. Yeah, and that's you know, and and I I, I guess the uh, the disclosure, the disclaimer for the episode is talk with your doctor, your physician, and make sure that yeah you're, that you're doing what's appropriate for you and your 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 life circumstances and your health. That uh, you know, just because you know some product or some particular exercise works for someone doesn't mean it's right for you. That's exactly and that right. And- stuff. Yeah. And I would say talk to your doctor and like going back to the first point that we talked about, just because someone on Instagram with a lot of followers is like talking about her journey to a six pack or to more dramatic things when we're talking about health to curing cancer or like this is a real problem, right? There are like quote unquote health influencers who are basically either like fabricating their own journey or using like just their own anecdotal evidence to convince people to buy their supplements or follow their diet or whatever. And I'm I'm a big fan of listening to everything and making your own choices. And listen, your doctor doesn't necessarily have all the answers. Like I don't want to put doctors as infallible beings, but I am a little bit uh, I'm more than a little bit concerned about what I see as a kind of crisis of expertise around health and the way that social media has really, really intensified that. Yeah, it's the uh, what's the saying? Uh, correlation is not causation. Yeah, that's absolutely right. J- just because something happened while something else was happening didn't mean that one actually caused the other. 
Right. Or that's what someone's unique experience is like you should evaluate in the same way that you would like a double blind research study happening in a university. Not to say there aren't problems with that. Those are not apples to apples. Those are completely different sets of evidence to evaluate. Yep. And the the unfortunate thing is I think, you know, very few people are trained to read scientific studies other than maybe those that write scientific studies. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Including me. Like, that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm so like, if you had talked to me two years ago, like I would say like, do your research. Like that's the most important thing. I still believe you should do your research, but I also think we really need a greater degree of humility and sort of like awareness about how much research each of us can actually do. Because a lot of the kind of stuff that really, you know, we should be like, A lot of the kind of things that we're thinking about evaluating, whether it's diet, whether it's exercise, whether it's vaccines, not to get into that, like I am not qualified to read a vaccine study, but I am qualified enough to know not to take, you know, my yoga teacher's advice on vaccines like that to me is probably not where I'm going to get the best information. Yeah. And and that's the challenges, you know, with all these things, evaluating, you know, does someone have the credentials that they claim to have? Are those credentials supported by their education or did they yeah. buy the credentials from some mill? Right. It's, it's, it becomes very complicated to know what's right. Yeah. And how are they using them? And I think I, I, I ask all these questions and I push us to ask these questions, but I also am like, but like, don't go down the rabbit hole of conspiratorial thinking because there's a lot of that too. Like it's really hard actually to give like quick actionable devi- um, advice on like how to make sense of all this because mm-hmm. there's so much conflicting health information out there. And um, I think a lot of people are rightly um, skeptical of institutions that we're supposed to trust. And you know, we're seeing the result of that right now. Yep. I think it's, it's, I think there's, there's a a level of skepticism, which is, which we should always have of, you know, follow the money. What do they stand to gain by this position? But we also want to watch out for extremes and, you know, they're always right or they're always wrong. That's right. Once we get into those camps, it starts to be, we're lumping people in when they shouldn't be lumped in together. Exactly. I think that's absolutely right. So any any other parting advice before we wrap up today? Um, I think it's great. So many more people want to be healthy and I think it is challenging to do. And so if you feel like you're failing, know that that is probably not your fault that, you know, our healthcare system and our industry is actually not set up to support optimal health for most Americans. We are all trying to figure it out together. And so I wish you the best on your journey, whatever that is. And, you know, maybe see you on a running trail sometime. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Natalia, where can people find you online? if they want to follow you. Yeah, on uh, Twitter and on Instagram, I'm at Natalia Petrozella. That's hard to spell, but I bet it's in the show notes. Yep. And um, I'm not as active on my LinkedIn and Facebook, but you can find me there too. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the Easy Pay Podcast today. Thank you. Great to talk. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Easy Pray Podcast. If you found this episode beneficial, please share the episode with someone you know and leave a review at easypray.com slash review. Notes and a transcript of this episode with Natalia Petrozella can be found at easypray.com slash 100.